I think about some of the things we have in our lives. Turn now to Ephesians chapter 1. And I think about uh, something that maybe uh, uh, I like, that preferences. And I think about the recent movie. Some of you, you don't like French onion soup, but you saw a wall in it. You saw a wally, and then you see up. I heard somebody close to me say recently, I like up so much more than wally, I couldn't believe it. I like it. So, you know, wally was good, but, 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 whoa. And I think about other people, you know, I, 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 I rate my 10 favorite candy, you know, like the 10 favorite sources of no nutritional food, like cake, <laughs> my favorite this or that. Licorice. I hate licorice. I love chocolate. That word but means something. It has some distinctiveness. It points out a difference. It could be real. Some of us prefer N1 to H1 compared to the word swine flu. You know, it sounds less repulsive if it's N1 to H1 and more repulsive if it's swine flu. So when it happens that somebody says, uh, swine flu, I sort of think about, but I prefer the word, and one or the expression, and one H1. Anybody know what I'm talking about here at all? You don't know what I'm talking about. I'm sorry. Catch up, catch up, please. Catch up. But the truth is, we live a life like that. Somebody comes to us and says, I've got good news for you, and I've got bad news for you. And they say, which do you want to hear first? And you say, blah, 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 blah. I want to hear the good news first. I want to hear the good news first. Or maybe I want to hear the bad news first. You know, when you get up in years, you're just hungry for that annual event where they raise Social Security. Oh, Mom, did you hear? They raised Social Security. And then Mama replies, Daddy, did you notice how they lowered food stamps? One happens, the other happens. And it's a trade-off. But sometimes there are things so horrible, so repulsive, so scary. And God intervenes. And God says, okay, but it's going to stop. This is it. And here we find this again and again in the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 1, turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll find a list of verses we'll look at. And we won't look at all of these in depth. Ephesians 1 verse 21. Here we have God's word. And Paul is writing, let's look at verse 20, 120. Which he brought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come, says Paul. What a lot of stuff in these three verses. The truth is, though, he's explaining Paul's explaining by God's direction at the wondrous things of the future. And then he says, but, he says, but, he says, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. You know, it's a wonderful thing to have a God who is covering all the bases. You know, a baseball player can have enough trouble handling the coverage of one base, say a first baseman taking care of first base. Maybe a shortstop or a second baseman has to fill in, and running will have to take somebody's position quickly in the midst of the game. But it's a wonderful thing that we have a God, for instance, who can cover all the bases of our lives and our experience and whatever we face. And so this verse is what it wasn't saying. It's saying that God is capable. God is involved. And it may not look like that. It may look like he's sometimes centered on one year or time. And maybe you lose use because you're a lofty, deep theological person. The word dispensation. Not a bad word and not a great one. Let's forget it. The truth is, the truth is, Paul says, but it's not that he's limited to one era. No, he is God of every era. And he is our God. And what a blessed book that is to think that our God is not a God of limitations, that he's never going to reach a dead end where he can be involved no more. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. This is the verse that is our major verse from which we're taking the words but God here. In verses 1 through 3, we have such a description of our hopelessness and our, actually, really our deadness. 
the impossibility of it all working. But finally, verse 4 says, but God. And God changes it all around. And whatever it was, it was horrible. It's all changed around. But God. And what you know this morning is true. He's done it before. He's done it before. And he's doing it now. And he'll do it again. And heaven's going to be a wonderful place full of people so happy in what he has done under these, this spot, but God, where he intervenes, where he steps in, and the whole thing changes around. Now, don't fall asleep on me, please. We're not fooling. We're not moving many pages here this morning. We're on the same page in my Bible. Look at chapter 2 again. Look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. That at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, writes Paul, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, were made nigh or near by the blood of Christ. What a great verse that is, amen? Because here is our God, and we are dead, and we are hopeless, and it's all done. Change the hopeless situation totally around. We don't know what's going to happen with Elaine Madison's sister. She's been in a coma for many days now. Elaine's been discouraged from coming down to see her, even apparently not much to see. Maybe not much hope. I don't know what they're thinking. And we don't know what God's going to do. But God could change all that around. It is a very worthy thing to still pray for one who is close to death. Because he, our great God, has changed that situation around in many cases. Many cases in the past. Many cases today. Our God has intervened. And many cases till he comes where he'll have mercy and intervene. And his heart still of his plan. And lives will still be saved on the brink of eternity. And it will be his doing, his living out, this stopping of all things, his intervening, and his accomplishing, his will, his glory being done. Oh, I wonder how wonderful this verse. But now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off are made near by the blood of by the blood of Christ. And everything has wondrously changed. Because of Christ. Chapter 2, verse 19. I'm sort of jumping in the middle of it, but look at verse 19. Now, therefore, says Paul, you are no more strangers and sojourners. Have you ever felt like that? Someone just totally on the outside. Maybe nobody shook your hand this morning in church. Maybe nobody shook your hand. You wondered why. Maybe you should have used a little bit more deodorant this morning, but you did your best. You're here, and you tried not to sit too close to other people, just a stationary. Oh, that smell too good, maybe, but nobody came and smelled you, got, got close enough, and they only shook their head and greeted you in love and cared about you and showed just the least little bit of affection or care. You felt like a stranger. You felt like someone from really outside. Pastor Rose regrets that that should be the case. I'm sorry that you should feel that way or be caused to feel that way. Certainly God loves you, and I believe that if we knew you, we'd love you too. And forgive us. But I look at this verse here. I know there's hope for all. There's hope for everyone. Verse 19 says, exclaiming, You are no more strangers, no more sojourners, but what? We are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. That word saint needs to be common now. You know what? When you trust Jesus Christ and become sons and daughters of God, they're automatically made saints, separated ones. Special, peculiar, positive intention. Citizens of heaven, children of God, God truly our Father, Jesus Christ our, our brother. And my friends know this, no longer strangers and sojourners, but it is by the power of God, Him changing everything. We are now fellow citizens with the saints 
And if a neighboring church makes a mistake that says that just a few exclusive ones are truly saints, then we know the Bible says that every one in Christ is a saint, separated under God. And we are now, verse 19 says, of the household of God. It was not always that way. But God said, no more of the old situation. He's now in Christ Jesus, my own. Look at chapter 4 and verse 14. Chapter 3, interestingly enough, has no single word in the English King James, but we'll forgive Paul for missing chapter 3. Now in chapter 4, there's verse 14. Here Paul writes that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness by which they lie awake to deceive. No more the simple one spiritually. No one, no longer just totally a babe or ignorant, but growing and changing and learning and sharing. Notice verse 15. But all that changes around, speaking the truth in love. You know what? My speech changes. The goal of my speech changes because God has changed my life. They grow up in the Him in all things who is the head, even Christ. What a blessed but. We have been changed with opportunity to move from childishness and things spiritual to things of maturity. Book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 19. Who being past feeling, sinners have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness and greenness, such was your life, says Paul. That was the way it was. And he's already described it in chapter 2, verses 1, 2, 3. This was your way. And verse 20 says, But we have not so learned Christ. That was your old lifestyle. But since Jesus Christ, all things become new. What's that verse saying? Old things have passed away. All things are become new thing of the blessedness we have in our God. For chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 19, verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. This is not what you have been fed by way of Christ. This has not been the subject of your teachers. No, your models, the, the ones who testify to you, what you see in the Word, this is not the way you learn Christ. You learn the way of holiness, he would say, here if you expand upon it. But you have been otherwise, but God has changed you. That's all that has been within your reach, and it's material to train and change, verse 1. Look at verse 28. How practical can you get? Let him that stole steal no more. Rather than in labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. What does verse 28 say? It's saying that when we become a Christian, don't pretend to be a Christian and steal. Those of us who have any sense know that we've broken virtually every single one of the Ten Commandments ourselves. If so, we are saying we should steal no more. Notice the but here introduces the thought of, the thought of but rather. Instead of what you once were, now newness of life, a newness of action, God intervening, and the call is for us to do differently, to be different. And so from stealing and being a thief, but rather, let such a one labor. Notice how the Bible is not, clearly not a book that just deprives us of doing certain bad things. Certainly, as a good parent has a desire to warn his children, so God wants us to be warned. Get away from this. Hate this. 